It was going to be a short sermon today, but I got my own lunch, so, <laughs> so be worried. This morning we're talking about entitlement or revelation. <clears throat> As Ken said, the words are a bit like a clickbait to get you into thinking. But um, today we're going to look at three miracles in the life of Elisha. So a bit like a triple treat today. Just going back to Elisha, which we've covered a few of the miracles in Elisha's life and we're just rehashing a little bit here what we looked at. Elisha's name means my God is salvation and Elisha's message was give your attention to God. At the time the nation was falling apart. Why was it? Because they turned away from God and they were worshipping idols and man-made gods and they'd settled for comfort, pleasure and convenience. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yet there was still a small number of people worshipping the true God and there were some schools of ministry that Elisha was leading. But at this time there was a famine in the land. <clears throat> and owning land was all about wealth, position and a good lifestyle. Good land meant good crops, wealth and abundance. If you had poor land, poor crops, lack and poverty. And the people in the land knew that wealth and abundance came from good crops. But they were idol worshippers and they turned their worship to their idol Baal, who according to them provided the rain, the sun, and the fertile ground for good crops. They were worshipping the creation and not the creator. It's a bit like today, isn't it? Uh, with climate change, people have said, hey, if we do this, we'll fix the problems of the world. Not worshipping the creator. But God through Elisha and the prophets have been saying, you've got it wrong. The one true God is your provider. Turn to him, give your attention to God. But they turned their backs on God and there was famine in the land. It's a little bit like banging your head against the wall. If I decided to bang my head against the wall because I wanted to, because I was angry, and Lee said, no, no, don't do it. And I said, no, no, I want to do it. I want to bang my head against the wall. And she said, no, no, you'll hurt yourself. And eventually, if I kept on enough, and she would then say, well, do what you like. And I'd go and bang my head against the wall, and I would reap the consequences. And so the people at that time were giving, a, giving up on God. They didn't want God to have anything to do in their lives. And so God gave them virtually what they wanted. And then there was famine in the land. And so our reading in Kings begins from here today. Elisha returned to Gilgal and there was famine in the land. Now the sons of the prophet were sitting before him. So he'd gone back to one of his Bible schools in Gilgal. Then a man of, from Baal Shalisha, so he came from Baal Shalisha and bought the man of God bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley bread and newly ripened grain in his knapsack. And he said, give it to the people that they may eat. But a servant Gehazi said, what? Sh what? Shall I set this before a hundred men? And he said again, Give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, They shall eat and have some left over. So he set it before them and they ate, and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. As we look at the passage there, the man from Baal Shalisa came and bought to the man of God, the first fruits, 20 barley loaves. And that's why I bought this this morning. It's not really my lunch. But barley loaves were not that really big. They weren't 
the greatest of things, probably feed a guy for one meal, probably a bit of a lunch. And <coughs> at this time, the prophets did not have enough food. And this guy turns up with these barley loaves and grain, a bit like Uber Eats turning up. Um, they were hungry. The guy turns up at the door with the food. It was harvest time, a harvest time of thanksgiving. Even in the time of famine, this guy, they don't even mention his name. He was wanting to give thanks to God for what God had provided for him. There was no Levite priests to bring it to. There was no temple to bring his worship and thanksgiving gift to. The land was worshipping pagan gods. And here was this guy who wanted to give in thankfulness to God. And he seeks out Elisha, the man of God. The gift wasn't large. It came from a generous heart. The man had no idea what God was going to do with the gift. It was simply given in thanks. Twenty small loaves and some grain. And Elisha's servant Gehazi says, Hey, for a hundred blokes, this is not going to go far. And so he shows us a little bit of his character, and we'll look at some more of it later. Gehazi says, What about me? Twenty loaves? This could feed Elisha and me for ten days. This is the leadership team. We deserve this. I'm entitled to be fed. If we give it to a hundred men, one of these little loaves has got to be divided into five little bits. We're not going to get much. But Elisha says, give it to the people that they may eat. For thus says the Lord, they shall eat and have some left over. So he said it before them and they ate and they had some left over according to the word of the Lord. Elisha's generosity over what the Lord provided was just to pass it on so that everyone could be blessed. There was food left over. Remember, this is nine centuries before Christ came. And I wonder if the disciples remembered Elisha's miracle when Jesus fed the 5,000. God is able to multiply our little things to accomplish great things. We started out with not enough, and yet there's some left over. There's not much, Lord, but the Lord shows there's more and more available. The second miracle we're looking at is well known, so we'll skip through a few bits of it um, as we look at uh, Naaman the leper. And we're looking at another kingdom this time in Syria. Now Naaman, the commander of the army of the king of Syria, was, great, was a great and honourable man in the eyes of his master because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. He was also a mighty man of valour, but a leper. And the Syrians had gone on raids and had brought back captive a young girl from the land of Israel. She, wa she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master were with the prophet who was in Samaria, for he would heal him of his leprosy. So Naaman went in and told his master, saying, thus and thus, says the girl who is from the land of Israel. Probably in our minds, as we read about Naaman, he was a man of mighty valour, fearless leader. We probably think of a little bit of the gladiator, the sort of guy that he was. And um, interesting part in the text, as we read here, this guy was an idol worshipper, but he was a fearless leader. And because by him the Lord had given victory to Syria. The guy was an idol worshipper. His country worshipped idols. 
He doesn't know God, but God gives him victory and success. Whoa, God, you've got it wrong. In Sunday school, we learnt do good, get good, do bad, get bad. We know this is legalistic thinking, but we know many people who have nothing to do with God, don't want anything to do with God, and their life seems to go from success to success. Also, we know many Christians who seem to go so much through so much suffering, but it's all about the grace of God. Is success the result of obedience, following God? Maybe not. When it comes to success, victory, our abilities and our righteousness have nothing to do with obedience. It's all a gift from God. It's only grace. Naaman, for all his success, had leprosy. There are different types of leprosy, some more severe. Different laws of cleanliness probably in Syria. But leprosy probably took all the fun out of his success. The real hero in this story is the slave girl. A victim of war, human trafficking, she had faith in God's prophet and she spoke up. Her life, her actions made her words convincing. And so we read about Naaman. He departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 changes of clothing. And he brought a letter to the king of Israel which said, Now be advised when this letter comes to you that I have sent Naaman my servant to you that you may heal him of his leprosy. And as it happened when the king of Israel read the letter that he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and make alive? that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy. Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks a quarrel with me. And so it was that when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. The silver and gold... In today's dollars were probably worth somewhere between two or three million dollars. Big amount. He was obviously prepared to pay a lot for his healing. But he arrives at the wrong address. The slave girl had said go to the prophet. He'd got a letter from the king and he went to the king of Israel. The king gets pretty upset, tears his clothes. Not recommended, I don't think. But the king makes a wise choice and eventually Naaman ends up with Eli- at Elisha's house. The king made a wise choice because when someone comes to you looking for something that only God can give, don't try it. Point them to Jesus. If it's for mentoring or advice and they're really looking for a dad, a psychologist and a friend and one person, What they really need is Jesus. As Ken shared last week, be an Andrew and point them to Jesus, the one who can save. And so Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he stood at the door of Elisha's house and Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh shall be restored to you and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, indeed, I said to myself, he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal heal the leprosy. Are not... Abana and Fafa, that probably didn't pronounce them right, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel. Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and went went away in a rage. And then his servants convinced him to come and eventually 
bathe in the Jordan. So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Naaman, because he was a powerful um, warrior, he had a name, he was a commander, he was probably second in charge under the king in Syria. He thought that Elisha would come out and perform some healing over him. Nope, just sent a messenger out and said, go bathe in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman gets angry. Why bathe in a dirty river when we've got clean ones back in Syria? Why try to heal a skin disease in a nasty, polluted river? God was showing that, the, showing that healing, that the healing, the miracle was from him, not some nice purified water anointment, but it was God showing it was all by grace. Healing a skin disease by bathing in a polluted river? Not really what your doctor would recommend, I don't think. It was God's way to show it was all by the grace of God. Making it in a dirty, polluted river was showing the grace of God. Itchy finger. Uh, and Naaman, so he returned to the man of God and all his aides and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now therefore, please take a gift from your servant. But he said, As the Lord lives, before whom I stand, I will receive nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Look, my master has spared name in this Syrian, while not receiving from his hands what he bought. But as the Lord lives, I will run after him and take something from him. So Gehazi pursued Naaman. When Naaman saw him running after him, he got down from the chariot to meet him and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master has sent me, saying, Indeed, just now two men of the sons of the prophets have come to me from the mountains of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. Naaman came to Elisha as the commander, a mighty man of valour, and now after healing, he calls himself a servant. He came proud and with a lot of strength and realises He's now just a servant. He confesses his faith in Jehovah, the God of Israel. But even now, he still tries to pay for his healing. Elisha refuses to take anything. Oh, please take the money as a gift, not just paying for it. But Elisha still refuses. The healing was all by the grace of God. You can't pay for the healing, it's a gift of God. And in the passage, which we haven't read, Naaman asked for some dirt from Israel to take home because he wants to worship God. And dirt and symbol and land was really powerful to the people at that time. But Gehazi, the servant, he has some different thoughts. Naaman's got all this wealth. He's got two or three million dollars on these donkeys. And how did he get that wealth? He got all that wealth because his army has been raiding our country, stealing our crops and taking our stuff. It's been killing our people and trafficking our people as slaves. Naaman owes us, or at least me, Gehazi. I'm entitled to some of his wealth so he runs after Naaman and lies to him, tells him a big fat lie, fake news. Because he says these servants have come, which hadn't happened at all. And he asks them, please give them a talent of silver and two changes of garments. 
So Naaman says, take two talents of silver. And he urged him and bound two talents of silver in two bags with two changes of garments and handed them to his servants. And they carried ahead of him, them ahead of him. And when he came to the citadel, he took them from their hand and he stored them away in his house and he let the men go and they departed. So Naaman offers Gehazi more than he asked. And when he gets back to the city, the two servants that were carrying the loot, Gehazi takes it from them and stores it in his house. Now he went in and stood before his master, Elisha. Uh, master Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? And he said, Your servant did not go anywhere. And he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves, vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence, leprous, white as snow. Gehazi says, who, me? I, I didn't go anywhere. Gehazi thought he was owed stuff. I am entitled. He was a servant, an intern of God's prophet. He had it all, security, food on the table, fellowship with the guys at the prophet school seeing God's miracles through Elisha, which he'd witnessed. He was a Bible school student, the best of everything, and yet he threw it away because he felt he was entitled. He gets leprosy, and it would cling to his descendants forever. Not very good medical diagnosis. In a strange way, his entitlement was a form of leprosy in his life. As we said before, the hero of the story is the slave girl. Her simple faith and trust in God, not the Bible school student who had everything, who felt he was entitled. And the third miracle we'll look at today is in 2 Kings 6. And the king of Syria was making war against Israel. And he consulted with the servant, saying, My camp will be in such and such a place. And the man of God, Elisha, sent to the king of Israel, saying, Beware that you do not go to this place, for the Syrians are coming down there. And the king of Israel sent someone to the place of which the man of God had told him, and thus he warned him. And he was watchful there, not just once or twice. Therefore the, king, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said to them, Will you not show me which one of us is for the king of Israel? Who's the spy in the camp? So the third miracle, is it a spy intelligent network or is it one man? The Syrians made plans, but they were always foiled by Elisha telling Israel the Syrians' plans. And so they meet in the war room, the Inquisition, who's the spy? And one of the servants says, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha the prophet, who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. So he said, Go and see where he is that I may send and get him. And he was told of him saying, Surely he is in Dotham. Bit scary, Elisha telling the king of Israel what the king of Syria says in his bedroom. Years before listening devices, God told Elisha the Syrian king's secrets. So the king says, Let's go get Elisha. Therefore he sent horses and chariots and a great army there and they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. 
And his servant said to him, Alas, my master, what shall we do? The servant is obviously a new servant because Gehazi had leprosy. And uh, if you're applying for a job as a servant with Elisha and you did a quick review on Google to check out your employment prospects, oops, the last servant lied and he got leprosy, not really a good reference. And now this new servant wakes up and he rubs his eyes as he steps out on the balcony and says, well, this is not going to be a good day. A private powerful army and all their soldiers have surrounded the house and they've, they probably want my master to capture or kill him. And as a servant, I'm not worth much. I'm going to die. Why did I take this job? I don't think alas is really the word he would use when he sees the army surrounding him. All these Navy SEALs, as we would say today. What shall we do, he says? One step, turn to the one who saves. Turn to his master, the man of God. What's the first thing you do today when you've got a problem? trial or a bad day, make straight for the refrigerator for a snack, coffee and chocolates. I always thought a balanced diet was a chocolate in each hand, but I'm not sure. Well, we do, we've had some medical diagnosis and we go to Google and we find out really it's just not a bruise, it's we've got to have heart surgery or something. Our first step should be to turn to Jesus, or as the servant did, turn to Elisha, the servant of God whose, whose name was, my God is salvation. So turn to God. And so he answered, this is Elisha saying, do not fear for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. As Anne shared this morning about opening your eyes, that the Lord would open their eyes. As we pull back the curtain... We get a peek into space, time, and the spiritual realm. The servant's eyes are opened by revelation. Maybe we thought Elisha would stop and pray that God would work some miracle and all the Syrian army would disappear or that hailstones would fall on them or they would fight each other and run off. But Elisha doesn't pray any of that for a miracle to happen at the time. Elisha just asked for his servant's eyes to be open. Just roll back the curtain and take a peek what is already there. This is what Elisha knew and saw, that God's protection was all around. It wasn't about the, the horses and chariots of fire coming. It was about seeing what was there the whole time. As we continue the story here, we see that the Syrians, so when the Syrians came down to him, Elisha then prayed to the Lord and said, strike this people I pray with blindness. And he struck them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Now Elisha said to them, this is not the way, nor this is the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And so it was when they came to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw and they were inside Samaria. So now Elisha prays for something to happen to the Syrian army and they're blinded and he tells them a story and he leads them off to the city of Samaria.
Now when the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elisha, My father, shall I kill them? Shall I kill them? This is the enemies. And he answered, You shall not kill them. Would you kill those whom you have taken captive with your sword and bow? Set water and food, food and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them. And after they ate and drank, he sent them away and they went to their master. So the bands of the Syrian raiders came no more to the land of Israel. The king wants to kill them. Elisha says, no, feed them. Interesting, he opened their eyes again when they were inside the city. They fed them and they sent them on their way and the raiding by the Syrians stopped. I want to come back to this scene here as we see. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. There was revelation. The curtain was pulled back. The servant's eyes are opened. Simply roll back the curtain and take a peek at what's already there. This is what Elisha saw, what Elisha knew and saw, that God's protection was all around. If we could pull back the curtain here today and we could see into space and time and into the spiritual realm, we'd never forget the message today. The king of the horses and chariots is Jesus. Who do we turn to with our small problems? Or with our big problems, we should first turn to Jesus, not relying on strategies or methods, but on the one who saves. Do we have a revelation of who God is, of how much God loves us? Lee and I both had a number of years in, in churches, in church youth groups and in uh, different things and we often have a lot of knowledge but not a revelation of who God is and I think uh, coming into this church into the grace understanding the grace of God was a revelation to us and if you had asked Lee and I a number of years ago um, do we understand how much God loves us we would have said Yes, we understand, we, we, we know the scripture, we understand that God loves us, um, but we've probably got to be pretty obedient for God to love us all the time, and there's things that we do that maybe he doesn't like. But uh, one of the things that um, happened to us when we came into this church here Ken was preaching one Sunday on how much God loves us. Do we really understand how much God loves us? And just waves of feeling came over Lee and I together and we both shed tears as we realised how much God loves us unconditionally. It was just a revelation to us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We often know the words and the text and have head knowledge, but do we have heart knowledge as God really revealed things to us? How many times have we tried to witness to somebody trying to give convincing texts or scriptures and the person goes all blank and rejects what we say? So much now we realise we simply introduce people to Jesus, like Ken said, like Andrew, brought people to Jesus and the revelation of God's truth is in God's hands. We might be, oh, there's a couple of verses here, particularly, and I'm thinking of the servant, today in 2 Timothy 1 7 for God has not given us a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind 
So much today we, in our news is, is fear-driven, isn't it? You know, fear for this, or this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, and what are you going to do then? But God has not given us the spirit of fear. And in Romans 8, what, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. We might be in a fearful situation, difficult job, family problems, finances, health. The servant was fearful until Elisha pulled back the curtain and revealed the truth of God's word, that God was there. In Matthew 16, we read, And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. One servant said, I'm entitled, I'm owed, and goes away empty. The other servant says, save me, and receives revelation. <coughs> Father, open our eyes to the truth of your word. <coughs> As Elisha's message says, or word says, give your attention to God. Shall we pray? <coughs> Heavenly Father, just help us to Understand your word, that it's not just words that we would have head knowledge, but we would have a revelation of who you really are. Father, it's life changing. And we just ask, Father, that each one of us, you would reveal yourself to us. You would reveal your word to us every day. We just thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.